everybody. Welcome in on a Monday. Ready to talk a little Michigan with you. And today we're coming at you with a three prong attack. I was over the weekend. We had things going on with three sports in particular at Michigan. We'll give you an update where Dusty May, the new Michigan basketball coach is. You know, the final four is set everything, but you know, Michigan has a new coach and how things are going with uh, May as we turn to April. We'll get to that. Michigan football is never too far from uh, our top of our minds. And today is no different. Less than three weeks until the spring game. I'll tell you where I'm at, what I'm thinking about the maize and blue on the football field, but we will start with the incredible run of the Michigan hockey team. It will advance to the frozen four for the third straight year. This Michigan hockey program, second straight year under their new head coach, second year head coach, Brandon Dorado. And as always, if you're someone who's out there and you're a Michigan fan and you're watching this in real time, I like to hear where you're at, what you're thinking, uh, what's top of mind with you. After I talk about hockey and basketball and football, I'll go to your questions. We'll get to them and we'll talk about them. Hockey gets top billing today as they had an incredible weekend. On Friday, they took on North Dakota, the fighting uh, Hawks. Sorry, you know, you know, you get a little bit uh, longer in the tooth. You want to call them by the name they were called about, you know, ten years ago. But they're the the fighting Hawks, uh, fighting Hawks, and it was an excellent game. And, and Michigan won it by one. And then they had to play Michigan State yesterday for the right to go to the final four and all year long, Michigan and Michigan state, you know, they had played five previous games and Michigan had just won one. So, you know, if you're a Michigan state fan, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. If it was a, if it was a seven game series, you would have said, if you were a Michigan state fan, you know, we beat you in five games, you know, four, four games to one. That's pretty much, you know, domination besides sweeping you. So you're you're feeling probably pretty good as a Michigan State fan, but then you're reminded, as you're reminded so many times when you get into the hockey tournament or the NCAA basketball tournament, it is a one and done, and anything can happen. And on every night, some on any given night, some team can come up and you know beat their opponent if they they play better. And in Michigan Michigan has been playing better hockey. You know, they didn't play great hockey in November and December so much that a lot of people looked at him and said, you know, this is a team, maybe they're even getting down on the second year coach Narado, because this is what happens with any coach who takes over, certainly a team that has had success or a program that has had success like Michigan hockey. And you're, you're winning with the former coaches players. Doesn't matter. You know, not, it doesn't matter that much that you've, you're the coach and you put, you know, the current group together. It's uh, well, they got the former coaches, DNA, you know, former uh, players in, in all of that. You got to do it yourself. And then, you know, so Narado, I don't know how much credit uh, Michigan hockey fans were giving them in the first part of this season about going to the frozen four last year, but this year it, it, it was his baby. And like I said, it wasn't looking great in 23, but the calendar flipped and still wasn't great. But Michigan, they turned it around when they played Notre Dame about a month ago. And they they swept Notre Dame and they hadn't really had a weekend where they just went out there and, and, and played like they did against the Irish. And it secured home ice for the, the Big Ten tournament. And then they went out. Uh, two weeks later, and and swept Notre Dame in the first round of the of the Big Ten tournament to set up a trip to Minnesota. And the, you know, go for a pretty good game, team, and as you know, they were able to beat Minnesota in Minneapolis, which set up the Big Ten tournament final against Michigan State. And then Michigan could have won that game. It was a it was a hell of an atmosphere up at Mun Ice Arena. 
And, you know, the Spartans with their new head coach, they, they got the victory in overtime and they're feeling great. Number one seed, uh, feeling, you know, excellent about themselves. And, and they should have, you know, going into the tourney. But I tell you, watching Michigan play against, uh, I didn't watch him against Notre Dame because it was Big Ten plus, And I didn't go there. But the following weekend, they were just on the Big Ten network. And I watched them play against Minnesota. And even though it was a one-goal game, I was thoroughly impressed the kind of uh, style that that Michigan uh, brought to the table, uh, brought to the ice against the Gophers. Well coached. You could see it under Narado. The system that they were playing, well drilled. The puck would go in their hand. Michigan, it was a one-and-done type situation. The defense was able to get to that puck, retrieve, and get it out of the zone, and then the transition, you could see the speed, you could see the passing and the pressure that they would put on the opposing goalie. And I thought they played a perfect game. I said so on this very podcast. They played a, a perfect game against Minnesota. They looked great. And then, you know, they you, you get into the NCAA hockey tournament, and you've seen it so many times where, you, you know, you've, you've – you feel better about a Michigan team and then you see them go down and then because you get in these kind of situations, but Michigan, uh, they played that way against North Dakota again, brilliant game. And then they did the same thing yesterday and they, they lost uh, their, their uh, top pair defenseman in, in Casey. And, you know, they're still able to go out there. They're getting offense from up and down the lineup. They are getting their defensemen to chip in. And oh yeah, Barcheski, you're gonna you're not going anywhere. You're, you're probably burying the lead if you don't put the goalie up there and start talking about him. He's got a great glove. And he he's you know, he had to be great because the the guy from Michigan State, top-notch goalie, and Barcheski stood up to him and and even played better. Like I said, he's got a magnificent glove. And you know, it's good for Michigan, the state of Michigan. I was going to say it was good for Michigan hockey. I don't know if it's good for Michigan hockey, having Michigan State good. I don't know if it, you know, it's, it makes an exciting game. Exciting game. State's not going anywhere. They picked a good coach, a guy that had, uh, you know, was a former Spartan, had got some NHL experience. And then he had worked with the development program. So he was very familiar and he was able to grab a lot of those guys and get them up to East Lansing. And that's why they're the kind of team that they were right off the bat. So, and you know, they, I'm sure are, are hanging their heads today because they had such a a great season, but then, you know, Michigan has had a better season because what in, in the, in the winter sports, it's an, it's an odd thing, but, and it's the, it's what you sign up for though. If you're a, a basketball or a hockey coach, you can have magnificent regular seasons, but if you fall short, in the postseason tournament, it's you know magnified by a hundred. And Michigan State, to I'm sure their their fan base's uh, you know ultimate dismay that they are sent packing by their biggest rival on the ice, Michigan, who sends them home. Woo, man! I mean, it's uh, after beating them four out of five times and and having a one goal lead and tying it up in the third period to see Michigan triumph and head back to the Frozen Four. Full marks for the Maize and Blue on a magnificent weekend and making the fro- Frozen Four again. And you know, you they're not. I don't know if they're toss ups, but you you get. You just got to keep getting into the frozen four and then it's anybody's game. Like Michigan could win as, as great of a program that Michigan has for hockey. They've only got, and, and, you know, pretty much my lifetime, you know, they won in 96 down in Cincinnati and then they won in, in Boston in what, 98. And they haven't won a national championship since. And, you know, they've been in a lot of frozen fours. They've had some chances in some championship games. So it, it it's always tough. We're reminded about that with, with Michigan football. It's really tough winning a national championship, and they have that chance uh, heading into next weekend, which is great. 
speaking of Michigan football, it's probably not lost on anyone that's a Michigan fan is that the Michigan football team for three years made the uh, college football playoff three years in a row. And on their third time, it certainly was a charm. I, you know, you use that. It, it's, it doesn't. It, it doesn't mean that just means it's, you know, there's this little symmetry there. I'd also add that that Michigan hockey, they get to the the they're they come up big in the postseason. Does not only have they been to the Frozen Four, which is the ultimate, as I already talked about, but they get to the Big Ten tournament championship game as well. So they they come together, turn it up. When it gets to the postseason, and uh, you you really admire that. Now, it wasn't the game winning goal, but it did give Michigan a two goal cushion. Frank Nazar, number ninety one, was uh, blasting down the left wing with some speed, and he took the puck and he put it between his legs, and then he flipped it over across the ice, across the slot. And then bang, right to his teammate for the goal. And this was, under the circumstances, one of the greatest passes that you'll ever see in hockey. And that's not an exaggeration. It is being called Michigan 2.0 because Michigan has the greatest single highlight in college hockey history. It also took place in the NCAA tournament years ago when a forward named Mike Lake was behind the goal and he scooped up the puck and put it on the back of his goal, swung it around from behind the net, and they called it the lacrosse goal, and and put it in with a backhand on the top shelf, something I'd never seen. I didn't even know it was possible. I'm not a hockey player. I don't see the hockey players, you know, screwing around trying to score, you know, different ways and everything. So that was the first time I'd ever seen that. And, you know, that remains the, the, the top play individual play in Michigan hockey history. But if you want, and and then I I saw that they're calling this 2.0, it's that way. It's that kind of a, a, a pass. And to give yourself the two goal lead to get to the frozen four, you're beating your rival and the number one seed, everything that went into it. I'm not going to argue that there's a lot of great plays. I've, you know, that we've all seen and even, you know, other team put them all in there, but you know, that's there with the pressure to be able to do that. Uh, what a, what just a magnificent play. Do you see I don't even know how to, I was going to say you see the, the attempt a lot in the regular season games, but I don't know how often that you, you see a, a play like that. When I covered Red Wing practices for a few years, Pavel Dadzu was a uh, member of the Red Wings at that time. And a lot of times I would just sit around watching Dadzu and he would do things like Nazar uh, did. But that, and you know, that Zook would do some of that stuff. He was the, a magician with the puck. He he did some of that stuff in games. Nazar, you know, pulled it out in the third period of a one goal game against Michigan State. A lot of times people get ahead of themselves and you know they call them prisoners of the moment and all this. So I'm gonna try not to do that, but I, I think that I'll remember that pass for as long as I live. Now, that pass, if Michigan wins next week and advances to the championship game and wins it all, it speaks for itself and, and all of that. And, you know, everybody wants that to happen. But then it it even it even gets bigger than like, whoa, whoa. I mean, when you, you, uh, you win a championship, it's like, um, to take it back to football again, football is never too far from our minds, it's when J.J. McCarthy made the pass on the fourth and two to Blake Corum on that um, second to final drive, and it was in the fourth quarter, the big drive. 
against Alabama. It, everything on the line there. You know, you're never going to forget that drive and, and how it went. And then McCarthy ran one. Never going to forget that. Showed his wheels. And then the pass to Roman Wilson, not the touchdown, but the other one that I think I tipped. And Roman Wilson went way up and snagged it. That drive is canonized more, not just that Michigan went on to win the Rose Bowl, but because they won the national championship. So, you know, it's if you're if you're feeling really good about yourself and you're a Michigan fan today, it's completely understandable. You should feel very good. You got you got paid off. And it doesn't matter when you started watching Michigan hockey. You might have been there for the blue and white game and all through that November and in December, where you're kind of watching them and thinking, mm, this is a, maybe a little bit of a rebuild or whatever. Uh, obviously, that's not the case. So to do it with the transition three years ago, they did it with Mel Pearson. And they got to the Frozen Four. Uh, and then they, Mel, they removed Mel Pearson. And Ward Manuel got criticized because he waited. And I don't know if I was, I was going to say I'll criticize the people that are criticizing the, the delay. I, I, I even thought at the time I read the story and there were the allegations and you know, there were certainly a lot of people that were uh, uh, going to be witnesses if they were going to go to court uh, against Mel, but to me, gathering information for a guy that a coach that had been around for three decades around the program and thinking about, hey, are we going to go to bat for this guy? Are we going to go to court? Or are we just going to take the easy way out and just remove him because it all goes away? <laughs> the first day that I read it, I thought, hey, he's, you know, there's, they're not going to keep him. But I think that they wanted to do their diligence and really think about, you know, should we battle in the courts? And even if it it brings all of this negative publicity. I think in the end, whether it was, I don't know, like a lot of people just, you know, you, uh, I do the same thing. You know, you try it yourself in the court public opinion. He lost immediately. And then you knew that if you just uh, went another direction that it all went away and they did, but man, Ward Manuel, when I hear people criticize him all the time, look, I'm not like in his pocket or his buddy. I, I always just thought, wow, that was one side and, and people are all very critical of this. And, and you, you just wanted people want things done immediately, and you know you, you let it play out a little bit. I wasn't as critical, I should say, about that move. But uh, I did notice over the last year when people are you know bashing Ward about the football team that just won the championship, about uh, you know uh, certainly Juwan Howard, which you know there's uh, you understand that because that was his hire, and then. Uh, to me, if um, Juwan was coming back, man, I would have been very critical. I would have been, you know, thinking, uh, or this was your, this is where you really stepped in it and screwed up. But, you know, he, he didn't. So I was ready to, if Howard remained as head coach, to say, oh, Ward, you know, all those people that are, you know, you, you, you screwed up. But he made the move and then got went out there and got the top coach. So this isn't turning into a, Hey, do you like Ward Manuel or not? I'm just going through it a little bit because a lot of people pointed to hockey, like, and he waited with Bill Pearson, but you know, Narado is uh, he's, you watch his team play and they are, you just say they're well coached, but they are, you can just see they're drilled. They, the way that they, the system, that they are on lock. I I think that this, uh, I, I know uh, watching them over the last month that they can play with anybody in the country. So it's not going to be a shocker. You know, you say it now, like you hear a lot of people, oh, anybody. Yeah, it won't be a shocker to see the, the Michigan hockey team uh, win. So that's where I'm at with hockey. So we'll get um, you know some of your thoughts on uh and on, on hockey uh coming up but the next thing is basketball and for basketball last tuesday you know, michigan introduced dusty may and last weekend uh, they hired him so it's been a few days i have to admit that i thought like that we would already be seeing the you know three or four players 
coming in, committing to Michigan, and you know the roster is going to be uh, you know going is they they had an NIL collective even before they were introduced, and I was like, man, this is it, let's go. But it goes back to a little bit of what I was talking about with hockey, and I'm guilty of this. You thinking, I want this done. I I texted. Not the right. What do you say? I sent a text to a prominent Michigan alum who is uh, involved, uh, an active uh, donor, big time donor. And I saw him down at the the news conference past Tuesday. So after I saw him, you know, I sent him a text like, "Hey, you know." When are you going to start bringing in all these big names or anything? Well, he didn't get right back to me, but then he's, oh, yeah, nice to see you. And he's, man, ah, well, you know, things have got to settle in a little bit, you know, he's telling me. And uh, I was asking him some other questions that I, you know, about uh, NIL and how much would it cost to get this kind of guy? He ignored those questions. We said, you know, it's going to, he's letting the coach get settled in. And I get that. And so I think as, if you're a, a fan and you're somebody that's like me, you're watching all this basketball, you're like, where's Michigan, you know, pulling these guys? And for me, the number one player, John L. Davis from FAU, who was the the straw uh, the straw that was stirring the drink for Dusty at FAU last year, he's got to be Michigan's number one target. Now, Davis isn't in the transfer portal yet. So talking about how much money it's going to cost to get Davis is putting the cart in front of the horse. And obviously that is, uh, you know, it's not tampering for me. That's it gets, I'm I'm not going to bog everybody down in NIL and tampering talk, but over the weekend, I was, uh, you know, asking, Hey, what's it going to cost to get this guy? And am I really supposed to expect that Michigan's just going to sit around and wait until, uh, okay. He's just going to decide to put his name in the transfer portal. And then Michigan's going to make the pitch. I think that's how everybody, you know, you you think how things are going, and not that you're some dastardly like program, like ooh, under the table, you're dirty, you're against the rules, you're a bunch of cheaters. But it, it it's not cheating if somebody from a Michigan collective calls up an agent or a family member or a former coach of Davis and says you know, we really want him and whatever the price is going to be, we're ready to, we're ready to match or here's what our price is going to be. I don't know. I, they could probably come up with a, a better sales pitch than that. The world's yours, whatever you want. So I, you know, the, I, I think a lot of people think that, you know, Michigan and other teams maybe as well are just sitting around. Oh no, they're, or everybody else is dirty. And then Michigan's, you know, they are not, you know, there's, uh, there's just, Everybody's working around, but it's still going to take a little time. One thing that I think we can talk about, and I'll do this before I get to football and answer your questions, is I can look at the roster that Michigan had last year, and there are four players that could come back for Michigan. Do I want all four of these players to come back for Michigan? No. But let me go through the guys that I do want back. And that would start with Will Cheddar. Will Cheddar it, next year is going to be a red shirt junior. Is Will Cheddar the greatest player in the world? I think, you know, you pencil him in as a starter. Not really, maybe, but I like Will Cheddar and I hope he comes back. Namari Burnett, who transferred in last year, still has two seasons to go. If Namari Burnett wanted to come back to Michigan, and has two more years, he's shown some flashes of real stardom. stardom. But he's not the, the greatest player, but, you know, he's got some potential. And, you know, as a scorer. So, yeah, I, w- I think Burnett would be somebody I'd like to see come back. Terrence Williams II also could come back. He's got a COVID year. Last year at this time, Terrence Williams completely lost his confidence. Most people thought he was going to transfer. He just uh, was a walking turnover. It was a mess. 
he came back last year, and even with everything that went wrong with Michigan, he had a decent year. He bounced back. So would I want TW2 back? Me. I'd put him in the maybe category. If TW2 wanted to move on and go somewhere else, I'd say, hey, you know, congratulations. Good luck. I say that to maybe everybody. Good luck. But, you know, and I'm not going to, I don't know how crazy I would go, you know, wanting him back. But would I want a 22-year-old TW2 over a high school player, you know, the, that's coming in that you're going to develop? Yes. Maybe. Maybe I would. And I'm not going to sit around and act like I've been through a million, you know, different business transitions and all this stuff, but I've watched enough of them where when the, the new owner comes in, the new owner has a, or the new GM or whoever, they've got a blank sheet of paper and they want their guys. <laughs> we were talking about before, you know, winning with the other guys. They want their players. They want, you know, if they're just going to go with the same guys that the other coach had, you say, well, what's the difference? You know, you, you change things up in a lot of cases just to change it up because you're the face now and, and you are going to get uh, tagged with the, you know, the former, uh, you know, and there's some culture stuff that could be there, you know, with, um, you know, the past. And so a clean break, you know, I could see that. So those are the three th uh, players. Now, the one, I don't know if it's interesting to you, is Jace Howard, the son of Juwan. Uh, to be honest, I would like him to just move on. I think you could say that's harsh, but if that's my feeling. I don't, you know, and he's not a Big Ten player, you know, but he's with Michigan, and, you know, he, do you go to him, and if he really wants to come back and, you know, the thing was, is he was also at the front and center of the Sanderson ultimate, you know, uh, removal, the strength and conditioning coach, you know, Jace was at the front of that and Sanderson, and we don't know the whole story there, but it was like a, you know, the culture's messed up and Jace didn't really say anything about it. It was just a misunderstanding. It was a misunderstanding that cost a guy that had been with Michigan for a long time, his job. And so that just from that part, but you could say it's not just from that part because you're if Jace was a, a tremendous player, you'd say, hey, let's let bygone, let's start anew. I hope that Jace moves on. Now look, he's not a Big Ten player. So even if he put his name in the transfer portal, would would Howard start at let's say, you know, Eastern or where his brother went, U would D. Who's going to have a new coach? Like those seem like nice landing spots to me. I know he's from Florida. Maybe there's a spot down there, but I was just keeping it local. Maybe you know, I think he could play on the team. I don't know if he would start. I'd have to look at the roster and all that. You might know better than me, but I don't. I, you know, I don't think it didn't feel like any kind of program changer. That's for sure. At the MAC or at the uh, Horizon League level. But I would hope that he would move on. Not that, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable for me if Jawan went down to a game next year, but, you know, it, people would talk about it for sure. It doesn't mean that they couldn't work through it. I hope that um, that he's not back. Again, you can say I'm mean or whatever. Uh, I'm honest, though, too, on it. So that's it when it comes down to basketball. Now I'm going to get to football, and then I'll get to your questions. And with football, practice continues, and two coaches were available today to talk with the media. Michigan offensive line coach Grant Newsom, the 27-year-old O-line coach, talking about uh, his guys up front. Going to be the key to any team, especially for Michigan, because you know about their offensive line and how much they're going to depend on it and, you know, what kind of uh, philosophy they have in terms of running the ball. But, yeah, the offensive line is going to be the most important thing for U of M, and they're going to have essentially five new starters over there. Miles Hinton's going to be over at left tackle, and, and you know, away you go. And then um, former Michigan coach, Brian Jean-Marie was available today as well. And you know, he's got a, a lot of nice linebackers to 
to talk about. So you'll see that over the next uh, a day or two. We are less than three weeks until the, the spring game. And you know, for me, people ask me what I think about Michigan football this year. Uh, I like when I look at the starters on paper, I like what I see. And if I'm making a prediction right now, I think they can go 10 and two. And I think they can make the college football playoff. That is, that was my first read. And that is still where I'm at. When would things change? You know, things change when you see maybe uh, some injuries. I think you could watch the spring game. Uh, that could make things, you know, change things in my mind one way or the other. We're all going to watch the quarterback play, and I'm going to try not to make too much of it, but we're going to make a lot of it. And, you know, I, I have one, I have a couple strengths, but one of my strengths is not overreacting, but it's reacting. There's going to be a lot of people, listen to anyone that you listen to that talks about Michigan football, talks about the quarterback position. They're likely to want to overreact or underreact because you'll hear them. And remember, it's just one practice. And I've seen a million spring game. Okay, so you're underreacting. And then we have the other side like, this guy can't hit the broad side. It's over, you know, that kind of thing. So it's neither of those. Let's react. It could be, you know, one, it could be one of those, but let's wait and see and, you know, judge it for what it is. Don't go in with an open mind. Now, I do think understanding that, you know, you, we're, we're all prone to a little overreact, underreact, and then especially since we're going to be seeing these guys with our own eyes for the first time, but you're going to have 60,000 plus of, you know, a million or two watching. That's a little different when you're stepping back and zipping the ball out there. Pretty easy to throw a little 10 yard out when you're just down there practicing your teammates, you're just going through it and everybody watching. Okay. And you know, they're all going to be like, Oh, he's great. He sucks with every throw. That kind of pressure is helpful. If I was Sharon Moore and Kirk Campbell, I would want to put that kind of pressure on these guys. They got to know when to push them and when to pull them and when to pat them on the back and when to yell at them, all those kind of things. But going into this game, there's no reason to be like, hey, don't worry about that. Everybody's going to watch you. No, let's let's get a little pressure going. Everybody's watching. Go out there and, and let it rip, like Harbaugh used to say. So that's how I see it. That's where I'm at. Feeling pretty good, a 10 and 2 mark right now. And Michigan being the defending champs, uh, still enjoying it. And I did a podcast over the weekend where one of the questions was about Michigan uh, cheating last year. Did I think that, you know, Michigan, you know, cheated? And of course, I know everybody, you know, uh, everybody that's outside of Michigan, they they charge them with that. And then people that follow Michigan is like, no, 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 no there's, that's not the way things happen. And I'm like, you know, Things played out the way they sh they should have for Michigan. They went out and and won their games. They didn't need that controversy. They didn't need anything that was happening that that came out and 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 away you go. It was it was a, the controversy of the day, but Michigan was able to work through it and end up on the mountaintop. And you know they didn't. They didn't need some uh, guy on the sidelines uh, because they didn't need any of that in the big games, and they still were able to win it all. They wouldn't have needed it. So that's still how I feel about the whole thing. Okay, now it's time to answer some questions. OT liked the Michigan hockey game against Michigan State. He says he thought MSU was going to win. They looked more aggressive, but in the third period, U of M put on the pressure and took it to him. I would say that at first, you are right, OT. I thought in the first period for sure. But then Michigan flipped the script. They got their first goal. And then they were going, and then they were just they turned the table. They were the aggressor. It wasn't in the third period. It was in the second period that Michigan started being the 
aggressor in that game against uh, Michigan State yesterday. Scott, wondering what a lot of people are wondering, if Michigan football and hockey could win a championship in the same year. Hey, you know, yes. Yes, they could. Richard is hoping the Michigan hockey team momentum rubs off on the Red Wings. Well, yeah, you and me and everyone is hoping that, Richard. This was a great sports weekend yesterday, you know, for Easter with family. We were watching the Tigers and basketball, and then we were waiting for the main event in Michigan hockey, and it was, it was awesome. It was an awesome day. Saturday, I looked at the sports calendar, and I saw the Elite Eight games, and I saw that the Tigers were playing, and I, I saw that it lined up where the Red Wings were going to play a 1230 game down in Florida. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be sweet. I'm going to watch every second of this one. And I tuned in, and in and the first minute of the game, Dylan Larkin, the former Wolverine, went down, grabbing his knee. And they, the announcer, oh, this is the last thing you need to start off the game. And, I, and the way it looked. He wasn't putting any weight on his knee. He's had some injury concerns, and the Red Wings are in a dogfight for every point. I mean, they had to have. And then Larkin's off in the first minute of the game. And, you know, the broadcast crew is doing a nice job saying, well, as we know right now, but I'm thinking, you know, they we know that he's not coming back. But he came back. I think he missed one shift. And, unfortunately, the Wings lost in a shootout, but they played a hell of a game. I know time's running out. They got a tough schedule, and they play again tonight. They're playing the Lightning, but it's like the playoffs now, but I'm with you. I do hope that that rubs off as well. Scott says, I need to treat myself to a Big Ten Plus. I I think you're right, Scott, about that. I considered it doing it for the – there was a bunch of stuff going on that week, and I just thought – you know, I, I got P, I got a million things. I've got, uh, you know, the, when it comes down to NIL and when they all talk about the TV contracts and everything, I feel like I'm paying my, the freight for the TV contract. I got Peacock. I got who, you know, I pay so much. My wife's like, you know how much we pay? And I'm like, well, uh, you know, now I got a seller on Big Ten Plus. What else do I get on Big? What else do I get for Big Ten Plus? Could I have got the? I so I would have got the hockey games, and I already had to go to uh, Peacock, and that's there now. Four checking and defense wins in hockey. I love a good four check. Defense wins in all sports. Scott wanting to know if Jawan Howard is interviewing for the U of D job. I didn't see anything about Howard interviewing anywhere. My guess is because you have the, uh, the way contracts work and Howard had, you know, another year or whatever that he uh, there's be that offset language where if he got the job for U of D that money would be offset. So not that he needs the money or not, uh, but I would, I think he would wait a year or two uh, before he would go back. Um, But I do think that uh, Saudi Washington, I believe he did interview or that could have been people speculating that he is somebody that they wanted to see interview for the UAD job. OT is saying that the Nightingale's mother, Mrs. Nightingale, was his junior high gym teacher. Look, you got a connection there. Got that Spartan connection, OT. Uh, And that pass was insane. OT says they call it the Michigan goal now. They call it the Michigan 2.0 goal, I think is the... uh, is what they call it. it. Eddie is saying that it was the first time ever meeting in the NCAA tournament. That's nice. Uh, also, uh, the jump pass. Old Hadley. You know, Hadley's a hockey fan. He, you know, now that I say he just shows up, you know, every 70 years, like uh, 
Haley's Comet, but, you know, he's a big hockey fan. Hadley wants to see Denver, Michigan in the hockey championship. Did you know Denver and Michigan are tied with nine hockey championships, the most in the country? Now, I'll take anybody, but I, I'll, I'll, now, Hadley, that you have said it, if it comes up again, I'm going to say that I want Denver because of that, too. It was, um, then Michigan played, you, you know, the, they played as, as well as they could. And it was closer than the, it was, it ended up being a three goal game. It was closer than that. Antoine talking. He says he doesn't like the Spartans, but that lady was out of money, but she should have known better than dealing with that type of woman. I, hmm. I don't get that one. I don't know what you're talking about. Here's a question about football. Dennis, did you get a chance to watch Michigan's football practice? And if you do, wait, do you get a chance to watch a Michigan football practice? And if you do, can you answer me one question? Do they split their team up so they can have more reps at practice? I have watched Michigan football practices in the past. I have not watched this year. If they make it available where the media can come down and watch practice, I will uh, immediately be contacting Josh Henschke over the Maze and Blue Review saying, uh, I'll go and cover it. So if it's going to happen, I'll be there. Now, I believe yours truly was the first ever radio station to broadcast live at a Michigan uh, practice that happened back in the day. And then I have been to another, you know, a few practices, but not recently, but do they split the team up so they can have more rep at practice? Well, every coach is different. You know, they can have, a lot of – they break them up where they they call them periods, and I don't know how many they have, 10, 12. They can have even more 20 periods, but, you know, a, a stretching period. And then they'll go with the, you know, the offensive line group, just with your own position group. There will be a period with them, and then they'll go through some specific drills. The running backs kind of just, you know, you'll see them uh, maybe going out catching some passes. Maybe they're, you know, running through some tires, and, you know, lurking on ball security, and then, you know, they get into some – uh, just the offense, and then they'll have you know the they'll have uh, reps from a, a first team, second team, even third team that will be going out there, and they're rotating guys in. And then you get towards the end, and then there's some you know some live scrimmages. So you're asking me if they split it up so they can have more reps. Yeah, they've got multiple practice fields. They got everybody flying. Everybody's going. One thing you could tell, you go to a practice, you, you do get a feel for some some energy, and that's to the coach. You know, he's got to walk around, and, and he got the whistles blowing and everything else. And what they do know is that the practice is just part of it because they've got cameras trained in on every position group, every player. And after they're done, however they splice it all up, then they go out there and then they grade each and every rep. Like, look at this guy. And that's why when you say they, you know, there's no surprise. Everybody knows who's on the first team. They'll go through that first practice, and I don't even know what do they have 80 different like reps of different things that they went through that they'll be graded on, and whether or not they're going to be the starter. It's a pretty exhaustive uh, process actually when they go through it. So yeah, I mean they're getting as much bang out of the buck and time that they can, and as many reps as they can for everyone. And again, everyone is. Uh, Everyone's different, but you know, you go to some uh, pro practice and college practices, and it's similar that way. Where there's, it's, uh, I can't talk about you know uh, high school practices. They, they, uh, I'm not sure exactly how they go through it and do it. Ot wants to see. He wants TW two back more than Cheddar or Burnett. Okay. That's fine. Look, all three, I mean, like, even though I said, you know, it's best to start anew and maybe you get a guy or two, you know, all three of those guys, would it be the worst thing? No. Does that mean that you got 12 guys uh, that are going to be on scholarship? So even if these guys, you know, you're going to have nine new faces. 
which is uh, an extraordinary amount. Who was the team that people were pointing to? Was it was it um, Bama that's got nine new guys on their team? Richard looking forward to next year. He's talking 17-0. and 0. How about Maverick? Nothing feels the same for me. Purchasing wins makes the NCAA feel tainted, even though everyone does it. I'm saying the entire thing feels bought, and the game has lost its purity and school spirit. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but Maverick, I'll go to basketball. Basketball has lost any of that kind of charm for, I don't know, 30 years. It's been a one-and-done type situation for basketball for a very long time. So let's turn our attention to football. You know, purchasing it, you know, players, uh, you have the feeling, and this is the whole thing where when it got involved with Michigan and what they did, everyone, admit it, admit what they did. What I would admit if we were comparing Michigan ethically to the almost every team that has won the uh, national championship in the last 30 years. I believe that Michigan ethically is, you know, they're mother Teresa compared to most of the other college football teams. So uh, it, it gets talked about a lot more because it's above board, but it was happening all the time. And people just got used to uh, it going on the black market, you know, underneath the table and now it's above the table. So I, I don't know when you're saying it's lost its purity, but I do understand that now that we just, it's a little bit like gambling. And now you can, I, you know, I could put a bet down before. No, I had to call a, an illegal bookmaker who was going to, you know, break my legs. Was that better? My mom and my, uh, my nephew were talking, we were, you know, it's Easter. We we're talking about gambling yesterday and they're like, Oh, it's, and it's so bad. And everything. I'm like, it's pretty bad. Would you rather have people betting when they're coming over and, you know, somebody's going to take a baseball bat to their, to their car. And, you know, it was going on there. Is that as the game lost its purity there, but I do get it. It, it because it has that feeling before you can kind of be like, ah, you know what? No, this is, it's the old college thing. I look at it like this. The players, it, there, it does have a much more pro feel now that it's all up in front. You know, the, the players are driving Rolls Royces and they're all wearing, you know, $10,000 chains. And it's like, wow, man, this is like the pros. And, and you know, you, you criticize a coach and you boo him like he's in the pros. And, you know, you trash a player like he's a pro and anybody jumps on you and you say, what do you mean? This guy's got six figures. He didn't. The players would trade all of it for this because they're getting paid. They'll trade the little criticism for it. Uh, I do think the transfer portal where guys can just be like, poof, and they're gone just like that. It's good for the players. It's not good for the game. And it's not good for the fans that they people can just be like, poof, and they can be gone like that. But again, players want it, and it certainly empowers them, and the coaches are all able to do it in the past. If I could change something, I would like that. You know, football, you have to uh, stay for three years. I hope that stays. Could you imagine that if you could go pro after one year of playing football, that would be bad. But with all the antitrust, I, I talk about it because it, it doesn't get talked about a lot because people don't want to see it. I hope that doesn't happen. I would like to see them do that for basketball. Three years before you can go pro. Let's go. Get a little bit more familiarity. Some of the guys, but I get what you're saying, Maverick. School spirit and all. Here's OT talking, uh, I believe, women's basketball. I, you know, I, I don't have a good feel. I I haven't watched one second uh, of, of either of those, so I, I don't have a good feel on who's going to win that. Uh, and put, I don't know what time that game's going to be on, but I, I'm going to... The Tigers are at seven. The Red Wings are at seven. I, I would watch it over. The, I was going to say the Pistons are at seven, which is accurate, but I would watch LSU of Iowa over the Pistons, but not over the Red Wings or the Tigers. But, you know, you can always just jump up and, uh, you know, put another TV or two up there. 
the charm was fake and just a way for the rich to get richer off other people's talent. You know, there you go. That's it. That's how we're feeling about it all. And you know, there's a there's a point to it when it comes down to it. You know, it's it. I like this about NIL and how the game has changed and everything. Back in '97, Michigan was the last uh, national champ before they went to the BCS and you know, the year after they went to the BCS. So it was under the old system. So I liked it. Now Michigan didn't win one with the BCS, which wasn't good, but I liked how it was um, a uh, Ohio state game before they were going to play them again in a, in a big 10 championship game, like what could happen this year. It was under the old rules. And this last year's Ohio state game, it was, you know, you want to make a case that it was, and people were, that this is going to be, this is the last of, you know, the, where it means everything in the world. And I know that Ohio State made it back in uh, two years ago to the college football playoff. And, and now that you're going to have 12 teams, you know, it's all over the place. But I liked it. My point is that. that Michigan won a, a big 10 championship under the, the old rules. Cause people were always like, Michigan doesn't know how to get to Indianapolis. And now, you know, they, they knew how to drive to Indianapolis with their eyes closed, you know, going there three years and then getting those three rings, you know, it's extraordinary. And then to win the championship, you know, from that aspect of it, where it was the four teams, however long they had it, you know, since the, when they only had the two teams, that was great. So now they go into this uh, new system with uh, with 12 teams and you're going to have uh, Ward Manuel as the chair. And I heard him briefly talking about it last Tuesday. You know, there's there, there's 13 people in that selection committee and they all vote on the 12 teams, but none of them, it's a secret ballot. I don't know, didn't, wasn't totally aware of that. I, don't know, I guess they all talk and then they don't know unless they publicly reveal their vote. So all of that, and I, and you know, that's uh, the, the 12 teamer is going to be pretty wild. It's going to be pretty wild because you think about the disappointment of from when Harbaugh came in, went from 2015 to 2020, you know, they weren't able to beat Ohio state, but they would have at least, I think twice, they would have made the college football playoff. So you don't have to be, that's, you, you might not like that aspect. I, I'm all right with, with training a little bit of every, this game means everything in the world because you're going to get so many more nice potential matchups, big time matchups in that 12 team playoff. And it, it does lose a little bit where it's, oh man, this is everything in the world. Just like those non oh, everything in the world. We're going to get a great games. And that's what it's about. And and even here, we have discussed over the last two years with Michigan's non-conference schedule. A lot of people loved it. Uh, you know, oh, we love the easy games. Other people are like, I like them a little bit tougher. Everybody likes winning, but nobody's scheduling. You know, really tough games and attractive games. A few, but now we're gonna get the trade-off where we're gonna have many more at the end. And then having said that, you know, Michigan's got a real tough one. As you know, on September the 7th against Texas. So that's it. Thanks so much for watching. If you're someone who likes to continue the conversation, talking about uh, anything with Michigan, I talked about hockey and basketball and football. That's what we're doing all day and all night over on the Maize and Blue Review. Now, you may have had experience with uh, other uh, entities that have covered Michigan and you get in and, and people are bully you or uh, maybe even the, the moderators are talking down to you and acting like, you know, look at this is a, this is a very comfortable and friendly discourse from what uh, I have found uh, when it comes down to the maize and blue review and the den. So I invite you, I, I, I welcome you in. It is, uh, 
It's all good fun, all good Maize and Blue fun over there. So if you like Maize and Blue fun, you like talking about Michigan, you want to know everything that's going on, recruiting and all of that, well, you join up. And you do that by going to michigan.rivals.com. All right, uh, Wednesday, you might have been a little bit disappointed last Wednesday because Jim Scarcelli, he did go to practice, and he just talked about the offense. Because we talked and we're like, should we do two hours talking about everything that you said? Or will you talk one hour about the offense and then you come back the next week? He's going to talk defense. We're talking uh, defense in um, coming up on a Wednesday. Here's Andre saying, is that uh, Eno? Etta. Well, you know what? We talked with Eno and he knows this channel, so. It could be. And, oh, you know, I hear real good things about you in the Michigan defense. I'm, if you want to, you know, hear me be, you know, hey, can you get excited about Michigan football? What makes you excited about Michigan football here on this uh, April the 1st? I would say you could say to me, Michigan defense. And I'd say, you know, that that is pretty exciting. They got a lot of they got a lot of uh, they got a lot of top notch players. They got a rock solid defense. The defense is going to lead the way for Michigan. And then somebody like Andre saying, "Do you think uh, No Etta?" I got to say this, and I don't know if this is No Etta out here or not, but every person that I talk with that has been to practice this year or last year. They all say, when it comes down to Etta, they say, they really like 96. Who's that? And, you know, so there's, they do like Eno Etta. And it could happen. All right. Everybody have themselves a great day. We'll see you over on the den. We'll, we'll, we'll talk defense and practice on Wednesday. Till then, goodbye. No April Fool's joke.